Hello, and welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast. Super excited you could join me today. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich, and of course, your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Now, on the Silicon Alley Podcast, I talk to entrepreneurs and top performers to understand what it truly takes to grow and scale a business. You'll get actionable advice that you can apply in your own business and life. Now, on today's episode, I sit down with Mike Frietta, founder and CEO at Kidfolio. But before I jump into Mike's full bio and what you can expect on today's episode, if you have not already, please subscribe and follow the Silicon Alley podcast so that you get notified when a new episode drops every Friday. And of course, if you hear something that you like, please be sure to share the podcast with others who you think would also enjoy it. Today's guest, Mike Frietta, Frietta spelled F-R-A-I-E-T-T-A, is the founder and CEO of Kidfolio an app that helps friends and family send money to kids safely and easily, all while creating meaningful ways to bond, learn, and build for the future. The idea for Kidfolio came out of Mike's own experiences buying stocks for his niece over the years, and then his own desire as a father to help set his son up for success. Before founding Kidfolio, Mike has been professionally in the social media and social business game since 2009, serving as a chief listener and community manager at two successful software companies. As enterprise community manager for one of the world's largest media companies, and as a social business strategist implementing over 40 online communities. His experience is living in five countries on four different continents and working over 50 different types of unique jobs has enabled Mike to adapt and change ahead of society. Mike's continual goals to help humanity build off of and shed the industrial age by leading the way. On today's episode, we discuss the importance of setting children up for success financially and the strategies to provide kids with a strong money foundation. Mike also discusses how bartending all over the world and that his family's local bar in Philadelphia set him up with the skills and understanding of people that he needed to build a career in online community building. You're going to thoroughly enjoy today's episode, and I love Mike's insights into finances specifically. He's got a really, really great golden nugget that I know that you're going to absolutely love. So without further ado, it's time for today's stimulating episode of the Silicon Alley podcast with the Mike Frieda. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle saying I'll never leave this place. Ooh. Mike, welcome to the Silicon Alley podcast. Super excited to have you on today. Somewhere excited to be here. It's another beautiful day in paradise. <laughs> it is indeed. It is indeed. <laughs> Speaking of paradise, you probably have had the experience having lived in five different countries, four different continents, and held a number of just jobs all over the place, 50 different unique jobs, I believe. Um, Know what paradise is really like. I don't know if I call it paradise, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been a fun journey, different experiences along the way, whether it's geographically speaking or in in the job world. It's 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 always been a it's been an adventure to say the least. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd love to hear how you sort of talk about your journey because when I was looking through your your uh, your sort of career trajectory, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what led to the next thing because you've done a lot of really incredible things, but. You know, there's no way that I'd be able to uh, to draw that one out. So I'd love to hear just sort of your journey and experiences. Same, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's kind of more of a of a network effect of things coming together. There's definitely not a, a linear journey there whatsoever. Uh, you know, you know, it started very early with my my dad would he was a, a truck driver and he would come back and have like extra salt in his truck, <laughs> and, and he would give us um, a shovel and some bags, and we'd bag it up and sell it in the winter for people to sell. So it was kind of like, he's like, yeah, you could keep a dollar of that. So you know, very early on, my dad kind of prompted me for kind of some entrepreneurial experiences. So oh, yeah. that, you know, continued through uh, my teen years and, and early on, uh, you know, he had me running the, the bar. We had a bar in South Philadelphia at a way too young of an age. Um, okay. <laughs> very inexperienced, but you know, it great, it, it helped me out. And, it, <laughs> and uh, you know, it was, it was helpful. So in those early days, yeah, I had some, I had some good entrepreneurial experiences along the way. And then I guess more recently, uh, you know, I, I, I was teaching English in Prague in, in 2008 or so, came back. There wasn't much going on. Um, I, oh, I do want to jump back a little bit because I bartended a lot as a kid. Yeah, it looks <laughs> I, like know. in like a number of countries and cities and all over the place. And that is actually more relevant than any of the other jobs. That was, uh, you're a community manager. You have to introduce people and very, you know, you don't want to be there too much, but you want to be there enough. And you're kind of the front of the house. And 
people will go on their way, but you, you kind of make those introductions and remember people. So it, it was, uh, in, in my mind, bartending is, uh, at, you know, at a local place is, is kind of like community management. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely prepared me more for, for online work, networking more than anything else. And, and, you know, you hear so many great stories. I, you know, it, granted, you know, this was a, an old, I don't want to say a, an old timers bar, but it was, a, it was a local bar where people had experiences. And they were much older than me as a 18 to 22 year old or so. And it did, they, you know, travel a lot, make connections, all the things, all the advice that you get unsolicited advice, yeah. which was really helpful. <laughs> And then 2009 comes around and I'm, I'm bartending at the time and I get a job, an inside sales job at Filterbox, which was a tech stars company. So it was one of the first tech stars companies. And so I was an early hire there and they said, Hey, we're monitoring social media. Uh, oh yeah, I have a Twitter account. Let me, let me jump on there. And I just took to Twitter and uh, you know, the PR people were ahead of it, the public relations and whatnot. So I started following them, started making connections. We started getting some leads just from tweets and started to learn about the blogosphere and everything that was going on. And I was like, man, I've actually been flirting with this. The reason I moved, uh, uh, and sorry, I'm just kind of bouncing around here. But no, you're good, yeah. 2003, I moved to, to Colorado. My buddy Brad was opening up a Allstate insurance agency uh, in Denver. And we had, you know, we didn't know what we were doing and we were just figuring it out. And so I started a MySpace account for our insurance agency, <laughs> which was like not a thing back then. Yeah. So I, I was already kind of flirting with like the power of, of the internet and, and obsessed with it and to actually work in it and to be in it was, uh, it was incredible for me. So, you know, kind of since then I've kind of just been almost, you know, fake it till you make it. We got acquired by Jive Software, which did um, online communities and, you know, what hit me there was I get in and we have an internal community and I can send a video message to one of the executives and he responded to me. And I was just like, wow, this, this new world that we're living in is also internal at the office space too. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> from there, I moved to Toronto. My wife's from Toronto originally and uh, was working on a political campaign uh, and we lost to, to, to Rob Ford, the notorious mayor there, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> and then I got recruited here to New York. Uh, uh, Tiffany, my, my former boss, she was following me on Twitter and was like, hey, we need an internal community manager here. You know, and I was like, okay, yeah. So we did the formal interview process, but she's like, I've been following your Twitter long enough to understand that you get what we need here. So come on board. That's awesome. So that's, what, that's how we moved to New York in 2011. And it was, you know, it was an exciting time back then. That was the, the iPad was just rolling out and News Corporation, who I worked for, had the Daily, which was a news app, which was one of those, the first ones there. Yeah. Uh, and how is this going to impact news? How is this going to impact journalism? And, you know, it was early. It, uh, it, so it was really fun days there. So I was running the community, trying to connect people from different companies within that corporation uh, where we had journalists, uh, programs going on there, how to, how to use Twitter for, for journalism and, and all that. Um, there were some really fun predictions that, that back then, <laughs> you know, I, I heard someone, a uh, uh, senior two, one was, Oh, Netflix has a, has original content. They'll never be on par with, you know, the kind of stuff <laughs> we're making. Okay. Yeah. And the other one is today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in the same breath was journalism is going to get news is going to get so out of control. I'm like, no, you know, the people will, you know, the internet will figure it out and we'll, you know, no, people will be confused and they'll be separate. And they were spot on in that regard of like, what the hell's going on with news today? Yeah. So yeah. it was great experience to kind of be, be around for that, that transition, right? It was kind of everybody had to, every traditional journalist had to transform to the digital age. They knew it was there, but now it was, it was a skill that you had to have. Absolutely. I'm curious how, so how did you said that the experience as a bartender, being that community manager, learning from, it sounds like you said a, a local bar, sounds like more older folks that were coming in telling their stories. How did that like impact your interests? The, you go into Prague, uh, Korea, like all these different places, Sydney, yeah. how, like, how did that bartending experience really, like, what were some of the skills, things that you took away? You know, it's, it was travel. It was all incentivizing. You know, the one thing I really wish I did, there was always that theme of, I wish I traveled more. And I had okay. an interest in other parts of the world. You know, I was, I, I, I did like geography. Uh, it was one of the, my favorite subjects in school. So I was interested in, in the rest of the world. 
But when I heard so many folks go, you know, I just wish I traveled more when I was younger. That, that after you hear it so many times, I haven't stopped traveling since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's been a worthy investment. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's interesting. I've, I've heard that. I think that's something that I've heard a lot too from, from older generations, parents and folks like that is that the ability to travel and the experiences that you get. So that's awesome that you're able to apply that. Um, yeah. Right now though, it's obviously not, <laughs> not great advice <laughs> uh, for, for yeah, the time in normal being. times. Yeah. When, yeah. when we don't have a global pandemic going on, great, great advice. Right. <laughs> so you were able to parlay that experience traveling as well as building communities and bartending and, and local sort of in-person environments into the digital f- sphere, Twitter, and using mm-hmm. that to your advantage. So what was that process like of actually utilizing some of these social platforms that at the time people weren't really using them, it sounds like the way that you were, to the level that you had been um, using Twitter and some of these social platforms? Well, what I found was it was kind of almost, at a lot of companies, it was assigned to IT. Okay. It was, you're the <laughs> computer team, you've got the, the internet, you know, the, like you, you've hooked up the computers, you have Twitter, like this is an <laughs> internet thing. And, 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 and that was kind of, you know, I, and I just came on, on the scene going like, I'm just a social <laughs> bartender guy who likes having parties and hosting people. And that's all it was. So for me, yeah. it was, it was, it was hosting online parties. Uh, it, it was just, it was social media and 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 i'm not trying to you know like the it folk were like yeah we kind of have to do this it was more like it was pushed to them okay. in a lot of companies it was like you're told to do this versus a natural progression of like hey i want to do this which is it's table stakes now there's people you know obviously people for that um, but back then it, it, you know it, there was a lot of people that were kind of reluctantly in social media who aren't inherently social people. So then, you know, the the social folks came along and I was uh, fortunate enough to be kind of one of those early ones. That's awesome. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, delegating that because it's, hey, at the time, the mentality of being, hey, it's a computer thing, you guys do this, but not really focusing on the brand, the community, the social aspect that social media now today, obviously, that we see with the explosion of, of all these different platforms, really what the purpose of them are. Right, so right. what happened next? So you've, you've ended up in New York and you know, I, I don't want to, I'll let sure, you tell the sure. story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I took some time and I helped my, uh, uh, a buddy of mine, he, he opened up the center for social innovation. Uh, okay. they, they're out of Toronto and I used to hang out there when I was there. Great community, wonderful community. And they were opening up uh, office here. It's still open here in Chelsea. Uh, so help kind of uh, get that going in the meantime. And I knew I wanted to work in, in social entrepreneurship or, you know, and I, I was I'm obsessed with, with co-working spaces and I'm in one right now uh, in, in, in how that works. So that was, it was a good experience there. And then a buddy of mine, he started an agency for implementing internal and external communities for companies. So a consulting firm. And so we, we had a lot of big clients along the way. So I was kind of just traveling around the world going, yeah, and this is before we had kids. So it was like, Hey, we've got a client in Mexico city. We've got one in, in Barcelona. Like it was just nonstop, like just going around the world and, and helping companies like get on board and understand how social communications can work internally and externally. Uh, so a, another just great experience. It was kind of the, those ones where when I was, I don't know, 30 or so. I'm like, what, what do I want to do by the time I'm like 60, the ideal job? It's like, I want to travel. I want to, you know, and I, it was like, well, here we are. <laughs> like yeah. the, the, the internet age happened so fast where we like, we were able to move uh, and do that. Uh, and then uh, uh, Bank of New York Mellon came calling. Uh, Suresh Kumar, who was the chief information officer, uh, he, you know, he convinced me. I said, listen, I'm done working with corporations. I, I like going in and out. He's like, yeah, but here you can make, you know, we're the oldest bank in the U.S. Like you started by Alexander Hamilton. And, you know, this is, yeah. if you can help steer this ship, it's, it's a big challenge. Don't get me wrong, but see it through. It's going to take years. And uh, I jumped on and I was there for five years. And that's, I really, uh, uh, you know, we're, the, the idea was that connecting the community there, mm-hmm. um, leveraging, we had 55,000 employees across the world. And, you know, since I was there through osmosis, it was finance and fintech. And yep. I started a little show called Fintech Friday, where we brought in, uh, you know, people who are running fintechs. I'd be asking you to be a guest right now <laughs> okay. uh, with Ostrich. I'd try to, hope, you know, bring you in, be a guest. And we did like, a, it was like a talk show. It was almost like a late night talk show. I do a few 
um, bad jokes up front, get the news <laughs> of what's happening in fintech, and we stream it live across the company. And we get a you know a couple thousand people, and if, if we were lucky, we get we always get a, you know a good a good studio audience, which which was nice. Uh, and and that and through that, I just got to learn so much about finance. Yeah. Uh, at a rapid pace. So that kind of was the culmination of where I ended up today was that, that that's kind of the, the, the path, if, if you will. The path. Yeah, I know that's, that's interesting being able to blend those experiences in community and, and then obviously getting the exposure to, to FinTech. I'm just curious, what were some of the fun, what were some fun moments from the FinTech Fridays? Were there any, any examples or any like really funny stories that you have from, from running that, uh, that show? No, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, there, there okay. is definitely some, some fun times. Uh, there was definitely a lot of learning moments. Um, when people came in for the first time, like the new executive, I would get them on and they're like, what is this? Like, this is, <laughs> this is happening at this company here? Like, you know, so there was a lot of that. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, pretty, pretty generic. It was pretty quick, you know, 20 minute show okay. in and out. Um, you know, one of the things we did was uh, uh, the emojis we would do like a venmo payment like guess the venmo payment so okay <laughs> so the, all right sorry i do got a fun story okay so <laughs> so at the end of it we would say hey what's the venmo payment and it was like you know a couple emojis and then people would have to submit online what they thought the best one was and the following week we would reveal those and those were always hilarious of what that payment was for <laughs> that's awesome yeah i love that that's great <laughs> that's cool so fun. mike you end up at uh, New York Mellon and something happens that leads you to start this company. Talk to me about that going from sure. building communities all across the, all across the world, large companies specifically working for, for New York Mellon. And then, you know, actually starting off um, your own venture. What was that experience like and what led you to start um, Kidfolio? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the, the cliche of I had this problem and I fixed it for myself uh, years kind of, you know, early yeah. on while, while working at BNY Mellon. So my kid was turning one and uh, even before this, as an uncle, I, I have a niece in, in Colorado and I would dread her birthday every year because what are you going to get her? You know, she's, I'm, yeah, <laughs> she's my only niece. And so I started with her, I just started making these little investments. I would say, oh, Bitcoin's a thing. Let me buy some of that. Let me buy her a Disney stock. Let me buy some of this. And so I kind of every year got bought her this like financial gift, which was cool. And sometimes we chat about it. She just didn't really care about it. Um, and then my kid was turning one and I was like, okay, uh, we're having a party. Do not bring anything. And I've seen that before. Do not bring anything. You still have to bring something, right? Yeah. I said, no, I'm going to make it very easy for you. Here's a website use Venmo, PayPal, Bitcoin, send a check and send it and, and, and give it to his college savings, whatever you want it to be. And yeah. everybody used it. And everybody was like, great. Thank you for so much for not making me like, have to go to the store and stress about this. And I'm like, no, thank you for not bringing stuff to our place. We yeah. have enough. And then my kid had some money in his college savings account over coffee and donuts. Like it was, it was a win, win, win all around. And so Christmas came around and people, and I started getting notifications. I'm like, Oh, people are using it again. I'm like, I forgot about it. I just set it up for that one time. Yeah. <laughs> and every, and people are starting to use it again. And they're like, Oh, by the way, can my niece needs one of these? My granddaughter needs one. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I had to set this up myself. This was you know, a process. <laughs> <work>. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, well, well, why not? And I'm like, well, good, good question. <laughs> so uh, that's how kind of Kidfolio was born was like, all right, let's make this app that I have already that I use and I love. It's a great hack. But it shouldn't yeah. be a hack. It should be. It's a stress. It's a. It's a problem that a lot of us have of stress of buying the gift, and then as a parent of like what what you get for your gift. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love how that's born out of your own need of saying, okay, we don't need any more stuff. Um, so, where at what point did you go from? So it sounds like you were yeah. getting some interest. How did you go from? Okay, well, I'll help yeah. you or a couple people out to like let's actually build this thing into a product. Yeah. So I was flirting with three things. Uh, it was, I was coming up on five years at BNY Mellon, which is a very long time for me uh, at being anywhere. <laughs> There's, there was a lot of transition, a lot of executive transition. And, it, and I have nothing but great things to say about it. But it was at the point of like, hey, we're going to do this. I was like, yes, that's what we did three years ago. And that's what we did. You know, and it's kind of like, okay, yeah. okay. And I was like, all right, maybe my time here is I'm not the new guy. I, I started to sound like that guy was like, yeah, we tried that already. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the optimist. I want to be like, yes, we can. Yeah. And those guys came in and they're like, yes, we can. I'm like, hmm, 
you know, and I was like, okay, <laughs> let me, maybe, maybe my court, my time has run its course here. And uh, Suresh, he actually was one, he left way before I did. And I, I, you know, I went to him because I, I was looking at um, moving to India to, to, to lead the team out there, stay at BNY Mellon. Okay. I was looking at a uh, MBA program out of Yale, the entrepreneurship uh, or an executive MBA. Cause so I was like, Oh, how okay. do I jump to the executive level here? And I was like, maybe I should run with Kidfolio and like make that a thing. And uh, you know, at the time we actually were like, yeah, let's try it. You know? And, and then I, I asked this Suresh for a recommendation for the MBA program. And he said, Mike, you, you, you've been running, you know, running around with startups for years. You know, all the executives, sure you can get an MBA, but you're going to get way more experience if you run this startup. Let me help you build it. Let's partner up and I will get the team. We'll develop it and we can be co-founders of this company and you do the marketing, you do what you do. You run the company, raise some money to, to do all your operations and let's partner up. And I tell my wife and she's like, you're going to regret this if you don't do it. <laughs> you're doing it. Huh? <laughs> I was like, thank you. And like, as soon as she said that, I like, you know, started making calls and you know, like, let's go, let's, let's move this. And that's kind of how it started uh, late last year in, in 2019. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So how, so you, it sounds like you, you had your co-founder, you guys knew each other from New York Mellon, had that experience and technical mm. expertise. So you decide to, to make the move. What's happened since 2019? Where are you guys today? <laughs> yeah. So we, Put the put the materials together. Got the deck ready. Late twenty nineteen, built a very early minimal MVP that yep. didn't expose. You know, um, I put it out there that I was doing this. Sign up for early access. Had about you know two hundred people sign up for that. So we kind of like tinkered with it, and then I uh, had the raise. I had, so I did a, um, a a safe friends and family angel round. Not sure what you call it pre pre seed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we raised, um, on a, almost 400,000 off, uh, individuals, a lot, six of my old bosses, uh, actually <laughs> invested in it. That's uh, awesome. That's yeah, why it's important and, to have good relationships with your bosses. They might, yeah, they might be yeah. the ones funding your next business. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And it goes back to that initial trip to Australia. I've been playing Australian rules football for the last 15 years or so. And a lot of my, you know, former players uh, from the team there. So that travel, that investment in travel early on helped, uh, help build this company as well. And so we've, um, you know, we've been busy and we've, we just sent a, uh, about a month ago or so we sent our first transaction over the Kidfolio network. So we've got, you know, the, the debate is, you know, put something out there and, mm -hmm. and build and build. Um, but with fintechs, both with child protection and data in that concern, we wanted to be really, we don't want, you know, we definitely want to be extremely cautious and do things right there. Absolutely. And then with fi finance, the same thing, right? <laughs> so it's not like just go out and break stuff in this, in this, in this regard. So yeah, we got that mentality, but at the same time, like, let's do this right. And even to this day, so I was really excited to, to get going a few weeks ago and we, we put it out to some users um, we got a new brand and, it, and I, I feel great about it. It looks good, but the user experience is just broken up front a bit. Yeah. And so uh, we we're just going through another cycle now. It's like, all right, let's get that on beard experience. Let's get it right. We've got all the infrastructure, right. Um, you know, from regulatory yeah. compliance, security, privacy. So we're close, but at the same time, you know, I, I feel like we did move fast, but at the same time I want to, uh, I like to talk. I want to, I want to sell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's a balance, right? Like, as you said, especially with FinTech and kids and all that stuff, it, there's, there's a lot more that, that goes into it and getting it right is important. So it sounds like you guys have balanced that move fast, but also make sure that you have everything in place. So yeah. how, how does it work? Like talk me through yeah, the right. experience with kids and like, how exactly does it work? Yeah. And so there's, there's two experiences, I guess. Well, there should be three, but, uh, and this has kind of been my problem too, is, you know, I'm leading product and I think I, I I've kind of, I catered it to too, too many people and that's, we made a bit of a confusing experience. So gotcha. let's okay. say one. So you as a contributor, you've got a niece or nephew and you're pulling up to the driveway or you're walking up the stoop and it's like, I didn't get anything. Well, break out kid folio and buy a stock or send 50 bucks and a video message. Uh, you just, it's in and out. 
um, you're, you're done. That's, yeah. that's the experience on your end. Uh, so, and then now let's talk about the COVID times, right? Like you physically can't be there. So you don't want to send an Amazon gift card. You kind of have to, cause there's nothing else. You can't send a gift cause who knows when it's going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know what they want. You're not part of their lives, like on a daily day basis. So leave a video message and send a gift and, you know, say what it's for. I want them to invest. I want this to be for college. I want it to be for a bike or soccer class, whatever you want. So yeah. it should be super experienced for you as a contributor. That's the experience. Now the parent, on the other hand, it's a bit more work. So okay. when I set up Teddy's, I was like, oh, I need a savings account. So I got open a savings account. I need a 529 college account. I opened one of those up. I need a brokerage account where I can, you know, put it to us. I need a trust. I need a uh, life insurance. It made me starting my own kid folio made me be such a responsible parent that I was more responsible with my kids' finances than my own. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Up, That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I set him up with this infrastructure of, of his finance for the rest of his life. And it was like, it ended up being this lifelong registry that he now has that, uh, yeah. So there's a bit of work for the parent setting up. Like we want you to go sure. out, set something up and then it's, it's create an event. Um, you know, it's the first steps or swim classes this week, or it's a birthday, it's bar mitzvah, okay. holidays, whatever it is, and then share it with your circles and they can contribute easily. So you're essentially enabling the, the grandparents, friends and family of, of, of that child to, to have a good relationship with them throughout. Gotcha. Okay. That's important. Sorry. Sorry to just ramble. It's important is because like, so my niece, when I bought her a Disney stock a couple of years ago, she's 12. She didn't care. Um, this year she goes, Oh, well I saw the Disney stock went up cause Hamilton's on Disney plus. It's like, yes, like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, we, we don't have much to talk about at being our age. Like we talk about video games, which is great. And then we also talk about the investments that we've made over the years. So it's working. It's like, it's strengthening our relationship. She's learning about finance and she's got a better, um, she's going to have something going on as she gets an adult. She's going to have a little something there going forward. So that's good folio. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, like how do you talk to your kids about finance? It sounds like you're almost mm. forced to when you're setting up kid folio or as a contributor when they, when, you know, like you said, your niece is older, but how do we, yeah. how do we start to talk to our kids about finance? Cause I'm sure we can both agree on this, that we don't really teach finance and it's kind of on parents, family, or, yeah. you know, you got to go learn the hard way yourself. So how do we talk to kids about finance? Yeah. So you kind of have to weave it in the day to day is, and again, I am not the expert on this. I'm trying to be, uh, is, you know, like for example, one of them is I have a lot of old business cards from a lot of old jobs. So I use them as a currency at home with the kids. So, okay. you know, you, you clean something or you do something nice that was even unexpected. I break out a card. Now, what are cards worth? Cards are worth ice cream and cards are worth when you, <laughs> like when my kids want things, they use their cards and give them to me. They're, it's a real currency. It actually gets you goods. So it's just like any other currency, right? Like they're all made up. They're all part of the human construct. This is just yet another one. So now they kind of, you know, right away, uh, Teddy was just, he just spent his cards. Just that's what he did with them. As soon as he got them, trade him for ice cream. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I started showing him, all right, well, there's actually like boxes of ice cream that you could have. <laughs> there's other things that you can have, you know, when his toy breaks, I'm like, all right, well, that's going to be like six cards to break, to, to, to replace. Like <laughs> That's going to yeah. cost, uh, you know, and I kind of make it up. But at the same time, he's starting to understand that money is a form of communication. And we, we're, we, we're, we work so hard on getting to, to know new first words and speak different languages. And, you know, we want them to communicate because that's powerful, right? That is a yeah. currency in its own right. Money is just yet another form of communication. So if we can kind of embed that there in, in our lifestyle, uh, I think that helps. Another great resource is the government finance. And you can add the link in your show notes, but they have a list of books for kids to learn about money and finance. And so we ordered a bunch of those for, for research and, and to teach kids. And, he, you know, some of them are hits, some of them misses, but they're all kind of getting the concept of trade and the value of saving and investment. So we, we, a lot of the books that we have are about finance that are kids' books. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, definitely want to link to that in the show notes. Uh, I think that's a good, nice, subtle way to sort of bring in those concepts. Yeah. Uh, so what, what's the future of Kidfolio look like? When you think of like the vision, where you guys want to go as a company, what does that grand vision look like? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it, it could essentially we could be a, a asset servicing company ourselves. So maybe we're holding the stocks, we're holding the artwork, okay, um, we're holding real estate trust. And, and when you come in and you invest in them and them, they're actually kid folios and we're, we, you know, we're in that regard, or are we kind of completely kind of an API and there's, you know, all those things already exist and we're just kind of enabling that. So we're actually kind of more of a, a social banking network for our family, which sounds yeah. weird. <laughs> like if well, Wells Fargo is like, Hey, we have this new social network for your family to use. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't think it would go over so well, but I do think there's the future in that. I do feel like that is the future of banking. It's, it's kind of that old school mentality of, you know, everything goes in cycles, right? We're, we're finding that online distance us a lot, but it's also, you know, especially in the COVID times, we're finding ways to make it bring us together. Mm -hmm. And there is a way of having that old school type of, um, of finance being a regular part of people's conversations. So, sorry, let me just say, I want finance and money to not be a taboo subject. That's the future of Kidfolio. Like that's our vision. Like we make it a family topic that you're always talking about, always working on. It's yeah. not a taboo subject. It's just part of life like anything else is. And that's where I really want Kidfolio to help enable that for, for families. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And there's, as you said, there's a number of ways that you can get there. The API route being the actual asset holder. Um, but I love that. Yeah. Breaking down those barriers. So, I'm curious, how would you, Mike, describe your own relationship with money? It's good. Yeah, you know, again, I think it's, it's, it's a form of communication. I, uh, I, I think uh, the more you have a handle on how you communicate with it, how you use it, uh, the better. The more that you realize that it's not real, again, it's this, it's like a language. It's like a country. Yeah. There are, it's, it's human construct and how, we, how you view it, you don't let it run you. It's like technology, right? It's... It, it can run your life and it can drive you in every way. And it's, it's having a, I don't want to say a command over it, but um, understanding that it's, it's, it's less intimidating than it should be. I struggled with it throughout my twenties and I was always trying to make money and try to uh, get to it. And I was always intimidated by it until there's a point where it's like, you know, it's not real. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's what you make it. It's the relationship that you want to have with it, just like anything else in this world. And so I, I'd like to say I, I have a pretty good relationship with them. We're still, we're still working things out. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like Kidfolio has helped set that up as well for, for Teddy and being able to go through getting the things right at the early stages. Yeah. And I want others to do that. So I, I've been able to do it myself and, and I want that to be uh, easy for everyone. I want it to be accessible for everyone. I was fortunate enough to, you know, I've got all the privilege in the world and I worked at, at one of the, the oldest banking companies and I'm still learning this, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm, um, uh, it, it took me setting up Teddy's kid folio to go, wow, I did not think of this at all. And I had all those things yeah. in place and I still was clueless about it. Right. And so it's, it's, it's such an inaccessible thing to, to, to get it. And, and I think kid folio can really just make it weave it into people's lives. So that it's kind of accessible of everyone having a good relationship with money. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think, I think you're, you're spot on there. There's just, there's so much when it comes to finance that you could, you know, overwhelm yourself with, right? Getting every little thing right. Um, and it sounds like the way that you have Kidfolio, it fits really well into the lifestyle of, Hey, here's what you need right now for, to set up for your kid. And I think I like, I like that approach specifically and, um, you know, being able to weave it in because you don't need to do it all at once. Right. And that's overwhelming, right. but being able right. to like weave it in as it, as it is goes over time. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. What would you say is the best investment you've made, Mike? Uh, let's see, I guess from a financial, uh, it was, I, I was early in Bitcoin. I'm not like a, a Bitcoin billionaire by any means or anything, but it was one of those early things where, you know, I'm on the web, I'm monitoring it. I'm like, this seems interesting. I bought my sister some as a gift and I bought my niece some, and this is less than $200, you know, yeah. <laughs> at the time. So it ended up, and you know what? No, it, it, let me, let me dive in deeper with Bitcoin because it, it wasn't the finance that, that, you know, granted, yeah, it did go up and, you know, great. Um, that wasn't really significant, but that led me down the rabbit hole of reading books and then understanding that 
Bitcoin is what led me to realize that money isn't real. That goes back to that relationship question. Yeah. To, to going, oh, this is just agreed upon value. Well, so is the U.S. dollar. Well, what do you mean? Now the U.S. dollar is backed by gold. No, it's not <laughs> anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and you start going, and you're going, oh, wait, this is, all oh, this is made up. Like we're all, <laughs> we're all just kind of, you know, that's, that's markets. That's, that's, you know, and it might be common sense to some people, but it, it really hit me t- learning and investing in Bitcoin helped me invest in my overall uh, awareness of, of money and how things operate. So that's really interesting. And the fact that it really led you down the education side, and obviously we know where Bitcoin is now and probably where it will be, you know, it seems like it's on a, on a, on a strong trajectory <laughs> and going to continue, continue rising in value. But the education piece really being the underlying thing to understand that so that you could make that investment and really understand it. So were you monitoring Twitter and you were just seeing like Bitcoin's trending or what led you to find it? I, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you what the, I think it was that, you know, a lot of the, I think a lot of people said that the first time was on one specific article, uh, um, Hacker News or, or one of those sites might've been on Reddit. I'm on, I'm, I, I go deep into Reddit a lot, or at least back then. Uh, so I, it could have been anywhere on the web and I, 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 I can't. I don't even, you know, honestly, I didn't even remember getting it. I remember like going later, like, oh, I've got some of that. And I was like, <laughs> when did I buy it? I don't even know. It's kind of like one night, late night in my bed going, this seems cool. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I bought some then. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't one of those things that, yeah, it was just like, oh, let me, this is kind of cool. Let me, let me test it out. Experimenting. Sounds like a yeah. theme throughout, uh, throughout sort of your, your career directly, trying different things, experimenting, learning about different things. Yeah. And one thing I always advise people is too, is like, I, I, there's a lot of like early adopters on Twitter that I follow for years and they kind of always seem to like be mentioning things early on that, that, you know, and I don't know if that's the case anymore. I still, I still do follow them, but it's, it's uh you know, it's a different place now, but at the same time, like there's a lot of either, whether it's a, a community online community, a lot of early mm-hmm. conversations happening there. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So, Mike, what would you say is on the flip side, best one, mm. best investment? What's the dumbest money mistake that you've made? Well, I, I, the biggest right now, so we bought a house in New York in 2018. And right now, it seems <laughs> like <laughs> definitely not the wisest choice. Um, at the same time, I, I, you know, in the long term, I, I know it will be and it'll, it'll work out. Uh, I, am, I am a bit bullish on New York at this moment. Um, but at the same time, like right now, we're like, all right, if we sold, like we would be out of money and that's a significant amount. So, yeah. so right now, what's historically been the safest, smartest way uh, has kind of been our, our most questionable one in this time. I'm, again, sure. I, I, overall, I'm optimistic about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're, we've been very thrifty. I, you know, I, 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 there's been a, a few things um, – we got a Roomba. That was not a wise one. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's going to save us time from cleaning. Like that's an investment. And that was like one that I'm like, ah, I love technology. I love gadgets. If they're going to save our time and make our lives easier. That, that one just didn't work. No, <laughs> it works. It cleans up, but it definitely like, you still have to do work yourself. So yeah. it, when you, when you clean it out, I'm like, Holy crap, like this place was filthy. But at the same time, I still have to go back and do all the work anyway. So there's that. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Mike, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing everyday Americans when it comes to finances? I think it's, it's awareness and in, in diversity. It, it is kind of a okay. cliche of like have a diverse portfolio, have X amount in stocks and bonds and, and, and people get that, I think, and they don't go much deeper than stocks they'll go okay yeah i've got some technology ones i've got some manufacturing and like that's my diverse well you know art has been performing much better than than a a lot of assets out there there's real estate investments you know and these haven't been very accessible either you know you had to you had to be a big time uh investor to get some of these and now every day there's there's new apps that and, and new services that you can invest in these type of things, even at a small scale. Uh, yeah. So I think there's that kind of diversity of what the, the, the Uber wealthy have had access to is now being accessible to, to average people to put in lower amounts. And that diversity, I think is something that's, that's really needed um, in their own. I, I, I think a, there's, there's a lack of knowing of the, of the, real diversity of a portfolio Absolutely. and then a, b knowing like 
okay, great, Mike, that's cool. But how do I use it? And like, what are those apps um, that people can use? Like Masterworks is one for art, Fundrise is one for real estate. And yep. there's, you know, there's, there's a dozen more of, of everything. Uh, send gold for gold. You know, there's, there's different things that you could be doing um, right away. And, and, and I hope that's, yeah, I think that's something I, I talk about all the time with people. Another one is startups. You know, what, what really bothered me when I was doing my, my raise was you had to be a credit investor. Yeah. To invest in my startup. And like the homies came to me and were like, oh, like I want in. You know, I'm like, I can't. Sorry. You can go and invest it. You can go to the casino. You can go in the sports betting apps that come out every day and risk your money there. But, you know, what are the, what are the big uh, funds doing? They're putting X amount of percent in high risk startups because they're getting returns. It's response. It's a responsible, diverse portfolio yeah. to have some high risk startups there. And the, and for the average, you know, the average American not to be able to do that. And I think there are, I think there's actually some, some, some services and apps that are coming around and doing that. And we looked at that as a possible way of, of, of fundraising, you know, doing crowdfunding, I guess. The equity is, crowdfunding. Is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, anyway, that bothered me a lot that I had to say no to people who yeah. wanted to get in on this, you know, for whatever it's worth. You know, like, you know, I wanted you to, to, to come along for the ride. The Kid Fuller ride ride's going to be a fun one. Come along. Oh, you can't. So anyway, back to your original question. It's, it's, you know, the diversity in different types of assets. Yeah. No, I love that. And how, how do you think we start to educate people? Is that through Kidfolio through, you know, cause there, like you said, there's, there's so much. And if you break it down and just investing specifically in diversifying a portfolio, where do you start? It's gotta be interesting. It's gotta be interesting. Stocks are, are, are mildly interesting cause it's like, Oh, it's a company. And there was that, you know, buy something that, you know, uh, that you wear or something, you know, like, yeah, sure. And so that helped people, you know, get into stocks. Um, you know, people might not be into art, but they might not know they're into art once they start exploring like, oh, I can actually own a piece of this and I can make a replica of it and have it at home or in my desk and tell my friends I own that. But like, you know, just a portion of it, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, um, you know I, oh, I have a virtual portfolio where I can kind of show you like the different things. So, you know, it has to be interesting. And I think okay. that's been the case before. It's like, all right, go to a wealth manager, give me your money and I'm going to put it in these places. And every year I'll give you a report on how it's doing. Great. But that's not interesting. Like that's not involved. Yeah. And that, and again, you know, not to, I'm not, not to, to, to say Kidfolio will solve that, but that's definitely a piece of it is every investment should be kind of a conversation that you and your grandson or niece or whatever is having at Thanksgiving is having on the, you know, these, these are part of the conversations you have and they're exciting because of that. So how do we make those, those type of investments exciting? And I think on an individual level, a lot of these companies are doing, I think they're doing well. Um, and I, I hope they get, they get more awareness. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense, especially, you know, your experience building community, right? Having conversations with different people, whether it's in a bar setting or an online setting on Twitter and building, building community. I think you're spot on. It's, no one wants to talk about something that is boring. Like, you know, oh, yeah. no, no one, no one, there's no like, Maybe there is actually, but like a subreddit that's about like watching the grass grow or something, right? That's not inherently <laughs> interesting. Right, right, but exactly. Yeah. So, I like that approach. Well, from from an uh, you know entrepreneurship standpoint in in your career, you know, what advice would you give to someone, an individual who was just starting out but was really driven? Plant seeds. Uh, you know the the example earlier about you know I was thinking about doing an MBA or a move or start, you know, these were all different paths that were possible. And one of them happened to, to come to fruition pretty, you know, that, that way. Uh, you continually having conversations. I, I, you know, this is not, sometimes you spread yourself too thin, right? Like you're like, all right, sure. I'm talking to 50 or going down 50 different avenues, but that's fine. Have a little flirt with a lot of different ideas and a lot of concepts. There's a lot of cool, there's too many cool things to do, you know, with one life. You, there, there's so many yeah. great jobs you can have. You can go out on your own. There's so many, and once you're, if you're an entrepreneur, there's so many different problems to solve. 
Um, so, you know, tinker and flirt with a lot of different areas and a lot of different uh, people that will, that could guide you and are doing something that you're doing and, and see where it goes. And then narrow it down to two or three. This has kind of always been my cycle of like, let's get a lot of these. Let's get down to two or three. And what's the, these are the strongest ways. So I'm continually planting seeds, see, see what grows the best. And then, all right, what's, what can we then plant further from there? So my opinion is, is to kind of always just, just flirt with a bunch of different ideas. Yeah, that makes sense. Figure out what works, right? You know, if you try one thing and it fails, you've only tried one thing. But if you've tried, you know, experimented with 50 things and five of them work, then, you know, you can kind of run right. with that. So that makes sense. And the answer is always no if you don't ask, right? Like, so ask around and, and that's, that the, you're going to find unexpected yeses the, the more you talk to people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mike, what would you say is the best and worst part of entrepreneurship? The best is definitely the lack of roadmap, uh, having to figure it out on your own, going from one thing to the next. Uh, I've never taken the same commute. Uh, that's one thing I love about living in New York City. I will take a city bike, a subway, an Uber, a walk. I'll do that. I will never take the same path, kind of intentionally. Uh, not that there's anyone following me or anything, but just kind of <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a paranoid thing to do. But it's always because I always want a different experience, right? I, it, I always want something new around the corner. Hence, like, why I took so many jobs and why I traveled so much. is like I wanted to see different things. And that's what, with entrepreneurship, it's every day you have these, like, oh, my God, what am I doing? This is crazy versus we're going to be a billion dollar company. You know, like it, it, it's kind of like this, this ride of like, all right, all right. So what do we do now? We have to figure it out. Uh, it's a logistical puzzle. Going back to the New York analogy of like, all right, well, it's raining today. Um, a subway is probably better. And then, you know, I, you know, you have to figure it out day by day. And that's the same thing with entrepreneurship. You're figuring it out day by day. That's not for a lot of people. Uh, you know, I, I think that's, that could be the worst for, for many people. They'd say like, that's not it. But if you're an entrepreneur, that's probably what you, you're a problem solver. And yeah. no one's getting, and you know, every time I go, oh, well, let me look this up online. There's no YouTube video for how to do launch your app next to the, <laughs> like the, the, there is a lot of YouTube videos. Don't get me wrong, but like how to fix your car and how to do, you know, things that are there, but this, there's nothing there yeah. for it. So to me, uh, that's, that's the most exciting part of it. And, you know, and, and jumping back to early childhood, uh, the legend of Zelda, the, uh, the original Nintendo game was the first game that was not linear. Every other game was like Donkey Kong or Mario Brothers. You went from end to end and this was free form and you had to kind of figure it out. And yeah, there were still definitely some levels and whatnot. Um, but that game to me is, uh, you know, goes, goes to, to this is, this is the best representation of, of what we're doing. We, we, there's no linear path. We all kind of expect to be told what to do. And mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's that, the whole go to college, get the goal, the, the 30 years and get the watch and go on. Like those days are long gone. And so you have to have that, that mentality of, uh, of, of free form. And, and I think entrepreneurship provides that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. No worst part. Same thing. Uh, same answer. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just different personality. Same answer. No, yeah. no, it, it is. It's, 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 it is the unknown, right? It's kind of, uh, yeah. you know, we're trying to plan a family and what we're doing next year and where we're going to be. And, you know, we're, we're going to be in New York, but uh, <laughs> where, you know, it's hard to plan the family when you have the company. It's like this, this yeah. could go bonkers. This could be crazy. And this could go bust this could <laughs> this can go either yeah. way and next month actually my schedule is completely different well you know i i went from product manager to now i'm going to go to go to market guy and i've got to have a completely different mentality day to day uh and then i've got yeah. to raise money so i've got to have i got to be a visionary for a while you know like so that's my my workflow my my work harmony i think yeah. as, as brad feld said in your, in your last episode like the work harmony changes every yeah. week so the schedules of who's dropping off the kids and who's doing that, it, it always changes. So it, again, it is kind of the, the worst part of that is other people, um, you know, oh, well, when are we going to plan this vacation? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I believe in time off. I definitely do. And, 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 I'm, and I'm one of those, I think I'm pretty well grounded in it. But at the same time I go, we're just going to have to go last minute and then adjust things, which isn't cool for everyone else. You know what I mean? So I, I think that lack of roadmap and consistency and knowing where things are going in your overall personal social life is tough. 
right now, kind of good because we all know where we're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stuck inside for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Grounded in place. Yeah. Mike, what does success look like to you? Like when you think about the future and, you know, achievement, success, how yeah. do you define that? Yeah. I mean, it is kind of the theme, I guess, this whole thing is, is a diversity of experiences. As long as, 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 as my kids have, I've got two, I've got my, my family and I've got my company. And as long as my kids, they have a continued diverse uh, exposure to different types of ideas, people, food, everything. To me, that like continuous uh, exploration is success for me. And you know what, maybe they might not find the same success, the, the same definition, but I, I you know, that general exposure is, yeah. is for that. And the same for Kidfolio. Like I want to say, you know, where, where can we go with this? There's, you know, I, we're not, we don't have a hard roadmap for beyond a year. Like, you know, you yeah. asked me earlier where there's a lot of places this can go and I want to explore that. You know, there's, there, there's a lot of paths I can go there. So for me, you know, success is, is, is staying away from a, from a monotonous, schedule of knowing, knowing what's next. Yeah. Gotcha. No, I love that, Mike. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you, you sitting down and, yeah. um, you know, sharing your, your story experience. It's, uh, you've definitely done a lot and I, I really appreciate you sitting down. I want to give you the last word. So whatever you'd like to leave the audience with Mike and please let us know how, um, offline the audience can connect with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, th- you know, the, the conversation in the last couple of weeks has been, you know, people love clicking on New York is dead, San Francisco is dead. And, and I think, you know, 2020, it's been really hard for, for all of us in a lot of regards. But I genuinely think we're going to look back on this as a, an amazing transitional time. Uh, so, you know, be excited be an optimist, you know, right now, again, it's, it's this, this hopefully is, is the hardest part in a lot of our lives. So, but, you know, yeah. there's so much good that's going to come out of this, hopefully. And, you know, so I, in terms of just life in general, but also this city, I, I wanted to just address the city or Silicon Alley podcast. I think New York is going to be in such an amazing place in a couple of years. Um, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the communities, the people, the, the connections aren't happening right now. We've got the culture, we've got so much going on in this city, yeah. but the connections aren't there because we're not interacting with each other. And I think that goes to, to, to Brad's book is in that community is how we connected actually. Yeah. Um, it, in, in, in startup communities. Yeah. As is that connection, uh, we have the things in place, but the connections aren't happening. So as we're all rebuilding here, just society in general, from every level, I think we're building it. I think also on a, on a city level, we're going to be as well. So, um, for the, you know, for those that, you know, see what's going on, should I stay, should I go, you know, build where you are, you know, go somewhere new, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, but also there's such a great opportunity here for, for everybody to, to rebuild, everything. So, so stay optimist. Yeah, no, I love that. And Fred Wilson, who's a big prominent VC in, uh, in New York had a blog post a couple of days ago that was about that as well, about the future of, of the city. Same, same thing. The people that are going to leave are going to leave and that's going to leave people that want to be there and rebuild. So. That's right. That's right. Let's rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can Mike- find me on, um, Mike Frietta, F R A I E T T A on every possible social network you can think of. Uh, uh, so I'm out there. I blog on Medium a bit. Twitter's kind of my home, I'd say. So um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's where I'm at. Perfect. And Kidfolio, can we sign up? Where can we, where can we go to get on the wait list? Yeah, or- kidfolio.app is, is the website. And you can sign up there now. And I think we're going to put the, the beta link up in the next few weeks or something. So you'll be able to download. If, you, if you're one of those early adopters that likes to tinker and wants to give us feedback, love that we would love that so um come and take a look if not um we'll let you know when it when it's out awesome thanks so much mike this was a lot of fun thanks for sitting down today thanks for having me appreciate it that's it for today's episode of the silicon alley podcast i hope that you enjoyed the conversation with mike frietta i love mike's energy and his approach to helping families build strong money habits together What really stood out to me is the way that Mike framed money as simply a form of communication. You know, if you take pause to really digest that statement, it becomes clear to me at least that he's really onto something, you know, from how we judge ourselves and others by the amount of money that we have in the bank or our paycheck, or even based on our spending habits. 
even reading your own credit card or bank statement can give you insights into your own priorities. Where are you allocating your, your hard earned dollars? So please let Mike and I know what you thought of today's episode via social media or leave a review on Apple Podcasts calling out this episode and be sure to share with others in your network you think would also enjoy. That's it for today. I'm William Glass, CEO and co-founder of Ostrich and of course your host of the Silicon Alley Podcast. Have a fantastic day, everyone. You got no time to waste, but still you hesitate. Caught in a circle saying, I'll never leave this place. Some words got you searching from the bright side over and over.